Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB Advanced Level Test Management Certification. We are in chapter two talking about managing the product and continuing ahead with our next sub segment that is 2.3 defect management. And as a subtopic today we shall be picking up 2.3.1 that is defect life cycle and try understanding what exactly a defect life cycle would be and how test managers should take a definition to that and what it takes to implement a life cycle within the organization. To begin with, of course, at the foundation level, we have discussed a bit about defect management and we told you what is a defect, what is a defect report and what is the significance of writing a defect report is all about. At this point, we'll be trying to understand what is defect life cycle and as a part of life cycle, we would like to understand that what are the various states and transitions possible since a defect is reported until it is being closed. So it is very important for us to really deep dive into this context and being a manager, we are someone who is responsible to define these status and how exactly the defect would be managed throughout its life cycle. But before that, let's set up some context related to this. Of course, we have understood this from the foundation level, but yet we are kind of like recalling or repeating it to say that uh, it's not necessary that defect is only identified during dynamic testing. Defect can be identified anywhere in the life cycle, being about right from the beginning, that is static testing techniques, uh, where you review the requirements or uh, when you talk about the design review, the code review, the earlier each defect is detected and removed, it is, of course, with a lower cost of quality because it's cheaper to identify and remove the defects early in the life cycle compared to that of later. And it's not that only static testing is the only approach which helps you identify the defects, whereas dynamic testing also results into failures, which later being analyzed into the defects, and then we report them to work on it. And every uh, single execution has something for us to identify. And no matter uh, being a test team, we have to understand that uh, when we conduct dynamic testing, many organizations think dynamic testing is only the way which would help us to increase uh, the quality and reduce the cost of quality altogether by identifying defects but we should not underestimate the power of static testing because static testing also helps you review the work products and when you have work products of better quality you would certainly result into a better you know dynamic testing and being more productive because you'll be finding quality defects at that point of time rather than just being limited to finding all the defects during dynamic also to add here of course uh, the fail, every single failure or fail test, it's not necessarily going to result into a defect because it's not necessary that the, uh, the problem or the failure which happened was due to the uh, execution of the code or maybe some of the functionality uh, misimplementation. Sometimes it might be due to wrong environment being used or it might be due to wrong data being used. In fact, it is also possible that a tester also misunderstood the requirement or maybe misimplemented the steps. So that's, there are several reasons, including TDD. Now, TDD is other way around approach. Of course, here we run a, a test without writing the code. So of course, the test is expected to fail. So it does not mean that it has a defect. It's just that the code is not yet written and we have to write it. So we just wanna make sure that every test manager tries to understand that not every single failure results into a defect detection. Sometimes the failures might be for other reasons than that of a defect. So we have to identify the count of number of such defects also, which could over a period of time help us to improve the overall process. But the point is not every single failure is resulted into a defect and not for every single failure we report a defect, right? And finally, to add a defect report certainly uh, gets progress through the workflow uh, since the day it is identified. And there are several statuses which it will be passing on through. So it is very important for us to determine these status as it would travel from people to people, uh, you know, with different naming conventions and different definition to these status. And uh, we will have to have a meaning to it so that all the team members can really be synchronized to those statuses and we can align to each other that what does the status of the defect at any point of time mean. And for that reason, we are further getting into the detail to try understanding what should be the major statuses which we can have for a particular defect life cycle. 
So to add here, of course, we are taking a template example. If you see here on the screen, we got some of the major stages like open, in progress, resolved, closed, and on the left, we do have rejected. So all we mean to say that it's not necessary that these are the only status what one should have. These are some of the parent status, which always we must have in our life cycle of defect, but organizations can have their own way of handling and managing the defects. Thus, ISTQB does not deep dive into it and say, this is something recommended from our side because we don't know what your project is. We don't know what your product is, and we don't know what would you do with your defect data. There could be different objectives, which we'll cover a little later, and we will talk about that uh, in more details. But right now we can just say that ISTQB doesn't have a recommendation that this is what the life cycle should be, but they can only talk about the parent statuses, which should be included, or without which a defect life cycle would be incomplete. So of course, uh, to start with, of course, a new status would be given to a defect when they're identified for the first time, where it can be now here merged with open, but most of the organizations certainly have a new status, which means the defect is identified and reported. And open would be more of like when a triage happens on it and people accept it as a defect. So we mark it as open. Same way in progress means it has been assigned to the developer. Now you can say assigned as another example, which we use in our day-to-day -day world. But in progress is the parent category, which is assigned to the developer and the development team is working on it. Now developer has few options to give away, like rejected or resolved. Now rejected here means uh, certainly the defect was non-producible or uh, we could not get the defect. So defect was duplicate or had invalid information or incorrect data, whatever. We just say reject for that, which simply means that uh, at this point, we don't see the defect. We cannot work on it or we cannot resolve it, right? Just because we cannot reproduce it. But on the other hand, I do have options like duplicate, which means that uh, the defect exists but this is a copy of another defect which you have already reported. So we'll be working on one, which will fix both. Okay, so yes, we can further multiply this or independently use different statuses in the real world, but parent category means rejected. That means it is being returned back to the testing team. On the other hand, if the defect is resolved, of course, uh, the resolved status would be used where alternatively we can use statuses like fixed, ready for retest, etc. And this status should mean that the developer has performed the required actions to resolve the issue and has handed over the defect back to the tester to conduct the required confirmation testing and then cross-check if retesting passes or confirmation testing passes. And of course, at the end, once the confirmation test passes and the defect found to be resolved, then of course, we'll have a terminal state. The terminal state means there will be no action required hereafter on the defect, which is called as closed. So close would be final status, but also to keep an eye on the diagram here, it says that an open defect can also go to rejected and from the rejected, it can come back to open. That means once you provide the information. And also I see uh, a line there, a transition there, going from rejected back to the closed. That means rejected to close is also possible. That means what if we accidentally raised a defect and uh, we had a duplicate of it or something like that? then we can even mark it as uh, closed directly. But if you see more detailed uh, life cycles, you would find that a new status can also go to closed directly because what if it is not at all a defect? It was just a misunderstanding. And on the right hand side of the diagram, you would also see resolve going back to open, which means when the confirmation testing fails, it goes back to the open. Again, open being a parent status, we in the real world can use it as separate status called as reopened. In case the retesting fails, of course, it goes back to the open state, which is more of like in the real world, we use it as reopen so that we can keep it separately from each other. Like if required to understand how many times a defect was opened for the first time and how many times a defect was reopened several times. So that's where in the real world, we keep it as two. But as we are talking about the parent status, we just keep it as one to give you the fundamentals. By using this fundamental definition to different statuses, an organization can look forward to draft their customized defect lifecycle and can pretty much define the definitions to each of these status so that anyone looking at a defect at any point of time should convey the message that what is happening with the defect at this point of time. Now, further to conclude, of course, we are just quickly talking about what other aspects to keep into account while defining a defect lifecycle and what is advisable to keep into account. So of course, uh, if possible, the defect workflow should be defined organization-wide. 
So it is not necessary that uh, it should be at the organization level, but uh, recommended so. But uh, if you see the projects are different from each other and you have different types of defect to deal with, you may have different criticality. In fact, the SDLC also plays a vital role. So if SDLCs are different, then you may have different formality to write a defect report. Uh, additionally, to add here, duplicate and false positive defect should be represented by a separate state. That means, again, rejected could be only for the reason of uh, letting the people know that the defect was not complete in all the manners to start working on that, whereas if it is complete but not uh, something which we should work upon, then we may have a different status. So every time you find something unique to deal with a defect, we are recommending that you must call this with a different status. For example, deferred. Now, in deferred case, we accept that as a defect, but we are not fixing right now. And that is why we are saying that we must have a dedicated uh, status to represent a particular outcome of a defect. Also to add, it is recommended to use only one terminal state, which I think uh, is very straightforward. We generally use any one method, uh, any one state to say that this is the final state of a defect and there'll be nothing done beyond this. The names of the states in the defect workflow should uh, be same as that of analogous states using the other entities like user stories and uh, test task. Uh, why should be the same so that we can stick to the common uh, statuses within the entire project work? Life cycle, like for example, user story also using uh, the to do in progress and done. So same way to do in progress and done. But defect life cycle in real world needs a little more detailed uh, set of status and transitions. Also to add, the consecutive defect should be uh, should not belong uh, should belong to different roles. If two or more consecutive states belong to the same responsible person, uh, there should be a good reason for that. And I think that's why we uh, currently have the defect life cycle, which certainly has next status being assigned by someone else. Like new is a responsibility of the tester, open can be a triage committee or test lead, then assigned is with the developer, then fixed is uh, for the tester. So it's more of like every single state goes to somebody else, uh, not like the two stages are with the same person. The common challenge with that is, of course, the person will not perform the previous activity and directly move to the second status. That makes a lot of sense. And I was forced to talk about each defect state except for the terminal should have more than one outgoing transition to allow res a responsible person or role a decision regarding the next step. So uh, we generally say that a workflow should have a to and fro path from a particular state so that if in case accidentally you move to the next state accidentally, then at least you can revert back or there could always be a possible uh, possible way to work on it once again before we can move it to the next one so we should have two uh, transitions coming out of every single state so that we will have multiple options to work upon and finally the set of attributes required to be entered when performing a state transition should be limited to those which give substantial value to defect management and here all we mean to say that is uh, there might be a pop-up which you include as you change the status. For example, if I'm changing the status from open to assigned, I would like to collect some data, like who approved the defect for working and which developer is working on it, what is the anticipated timeline to fix the defect. So these are the information which we collect. And similarly, if I move from assigned to fix, then what is the root cause? What are the corrections actions taken? So I may have different set of information to be collected uh, when I move from one state to another. but the message which we are trying to convey here is more about we should keep it limited to what you are interested in. Just don't make it a form that people get tired of filling or sometimes they don't feel like filling the fields which are highlighted there. So keep it limited to those information which you are interested in and that should do the job. So pretty much to talk about defect lifecycle, this is all what we had from here. That's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.